I had to have some water. Boy, there, things are blinding me. Good morning, huh? Yeah, there we go. I see the light, that song. Was that, what song was, who did that? Was that, was that an old Hank Williams song or? I, well, I don't know, but there was somebody that did the original. Oh, was it? Okay. I seen, yeah, they did. They must have, yeah. I can't remember. I'm kind of thinking it was an old Hank Williams song, but I don't know. Anyhow, after that spiritual discussion, <laughs> we ought to go ahead and get started because we've got dinner cooking back there, I know. So, um, good to see everybody today and to have you all. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin our service. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for another week you've given us, and despite all the turmoil in the world, we don't have to worry about it because we know you're in charge. We, that, we don't have to like it either, but since you're in charge, we know it's going to work out, and we thank you for keeping us safe and allowing us the opportunity of coming back to worship you with some songs and hearing a bit from your word and for the food that's prepared for our monthly dinner. We just give you thanks for all of that and thanks for all of our many blessings that oftentimes we don't even acknowledge or realize of the good things that you provided for us. So we ask that you be with us during these coming few moments and uh, <clears throat> we just lift our, these moments up to you and ask for your honor and glory be represented in that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song leader, she's back again today. I'm new and improved, though. <laughs> Fred and I ran into some hair scissors yesterday, so our ears are lowered, but that's all right. <laughs> yep, that was it. <laughs> Last night we were watching Huckabee. How many of you ever watched Huckabee? Good. If you don't, you should try to find it. It is a very, very good show. Um, there are several Christian movies coming out now. So uh, they're the fifth um, God is Not Dead movies coming out, like September the 12th. And lo and behold, it kind of goes along with the election process that we're going through right now. So um, that'll be a good one to watch, too, when we can get it on Blu-ray. And then there's another one that's coming out. I don't remember the titles, the, the title of this one, but it's about child trafficking. And um, I had no idea that there is children in the United States that are bound in buildings and never get to see the light of day. I had no idea. And because they're sewing or they're doing whatever and so all these people are saying don't buy from china don't you know because they're making t-shirts or whatever buy from the united states it's happening here and that is so so sad and um uh is it tony robbins is that what his name was if you know him um you can look him up too but he was talking about all the kids that he had helped rescue overseas and um, oh my gosh it was just you need to look it up because it's it'll turn your heart it'll make you your stomach sick and um, we got to do something to protect our kids and these kids that are coming over here it is horrible um, Eric probably knows more than <laughs> just from 
the military and stuff. It is horrible. Um, anyway, got to pray for our kids. Um, and love on and keep an eye on your babies because it can happen in a split second. Anyway, in that news, <laughs> we're going to sing um, Trust in the Lord and we're going to sing hymn number 133. The blood will never lose its power. Thank goodness. <laughs> are acting up today. I don't know if it's allergies or what, but I'm having trouble seeing the words, even though <laughs> they're giant. <laughs> anyway, in number 52, he leadeth me, O blessed thought.
if you can stand and join me as we say the Lord's Prayer, that would be awesome. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, let's greet one another with a Bethel hug. Fred gave me full control. Woohoo! <laughs> Tammy's warning me. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Would my two wonderful children please come forward as we sing Jesus Loves Me? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. How are you guys? Good. I haven't seen you in a long time because I haven't been here. Did you guys graduate from high school yet? No. no? Okay. I thought maybe it had been that long since I'd seen you. 
<laughs> They're driving already. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. What grade are you in now? Fifth. Okay. What grade? Third, fifth, and third. Hey, we got grandkids in those ages. Or grades, I mean. Cool. Are you liking it so far? Cool. Are you happy to be in school instead of being outside where it's hot? Mm, you'd rather be outside where it's hot? No, but you don't want to be in school? Yeah. Do you like your teacher? Do you have more than one teacher or just one? More than one. More than one. Oh, you, you've moved up, huh? Cool. Well, I love your overalls. Those are very fancy. Look very cute. Okay, well, I have a challenge for you. You know, you've got enough. You can't learn enough, okay? So, now that school has started, oh, well, I thought it would be a cool idea if you guys learned some Bible verses and if you could tell them to me. You don't have to tell them in front of church unless you just want to, but I won't make you. But there's going to be six of them. I'm not going to give them all six of them to you right now because that would just be overwhelming. So we're going to start with just one today. And then if you can tell me all six when we get done, you can tell them one at a time, then there'll be something, a prize. It won't be yucky. We'll figure it out, okay? I don't know what it is right now. I'll keep you in suspense. But we're going to start off with, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, I figured that one would kind of help us as we're in school. Because sometimes school can be overwhelming and scary and dark. And I thought, a lamp to my feet. Now, why would you need a lamp to your feet? Why is God saying that? Where is he getting that idea from? Well, and what is a lamp? Is he talking about an actual lamp? No, I don't think so. What's the word? What's he talking about? Your word. Do you have any idea? I think he's talking about the Bible. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Did you know that there's all kinds of instructions in the Bible that tell us how to live our lives? And if we would just open it up and look at it like that verse, it tells us how to live our life. And if we just pay attention, our lives would be a lot simpler. But unfortunately, take it from the older people, including myself, that we don't always open the Bible and read it and apply it to our lives. And if we just would, there'd be a lot less trouble in the world. So, as you go through fifth and third grade, I thought it would be a great idea if you could memorize, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Just like the flashlight helps you see in the dark helps you get through when things are gloomy and dark. God's word helps you see when things are scary and helps you, whoops, helps you see what you need to do through life. Okay? So here's each one of you get one of these. You can tape it on your mirror or tape it in your bedroom, however you want to do it. It's even laminated so it doesn't get torn and you can help you to memorize it, okay? And then there's some color sheets to help you do that too. There you go, sir. So let's pray and then you guys can go back and sit down. Dad. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that your word guides us and directs us and tells us how we need to live our lives. I pray, Lord, that even as adults and as children, that we would open up your book and actually read it and apply the teachings that you have for us in the Bible 
to live our lives so that we would actually have a better life. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay. You can go sit down. Thank you very much. can't remember what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, we're going to sing hymn number 333. This song reminds me of growing up in my home church, Orion Baptist Church, and today is their anniversary Sunday and they are 124 years old we beat them <laughs> so I'm excited for them have our tithes and offerings at this time. thanking you for your provisions and for the opportunity we have to 
give back a small portion of the many blessings you've given us. And, and we just appreciate the gift and the giver and uh, pray that we as a church and as individuals will use the money to spread the word and to bring honor and glory to you. So we thank you for these gifts and ask you to bless them and all in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, my preachers, hear me low. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I forgot to mention earlier, and I should have at the beginning, but um, of course last Sunday we announced that Richard Sparkman had just passed away, and I've talked with June a couple of times, and she's in Owasso with her daughter right now, so she wanted to be there. I don't know how long she's going to stay. She'll have to come back at some point and take care of things and this and that, but just wanted to make sure and mention to pray for Richard and pray for June and the family members, they're kind of having a little bit of a struggle as to where they're going to have the services. I think that they're, they've kind of decided to go ahead and have it here, but they, some of the kids wanted to have it at the funeral home, and, you know, so she's dealing with that kind of stuff. And Then Alana had mentioned that her eyes weren't working very well. That's what she said the day after we got married, too. So <laughs> she's been saying it for what, 27 years now? <laughs> and you can see all the rest of the uh, things going on here on the prayer list. I won't read all of them. <clears throat> well, last week, we started the last four verses of Romans chapter 9. And I thought we'll probably get through it this time. Maybe not, but I hope we do. And start Romans 10 then. But I wanted to read those verses again just to refresh our memory. Um, and I'm going to read them out of the message. I read them out of the New Living Translation and the message last week. But let me just read the message. How can we sum this up? Of course, Paul's talking about being made right with God the entire chapter before this. So he says, how can we sum this up? All those people who didn't seem interested in what God was doing actually embraced what God was doing as he straightened out their lives. And Israel, who seemed so interested in reading and talking about what God was doing, missed it. How could they miss it? Because instead of trusting God, they took over. They were absorbed in what they themselves were doing. They were so absorbed in their God projects that they didn't notice God right in front of them, like a huge rock in the middle of the road. And so they stumbled into him and went sprawling. Isaiah, again, gives us the metaphor for pulling this together. Careful, I've put a huge stone on the road to Mount Zion, a stone you can't get around. But the stone is me. If you're looking for me, you'll find me on the way, not in the way. Paul's been dealing with, as I said, being made right with God and why and specifically, as we got down to this chapter, why people in Israel reject God. And they still do today. Some people from the Jewish uh, persuasion, the nationality, the Jewish people, the Israelites, reject God and some accept him. And we read earlier where Paul said that there was going to be a remnant, that is, a group that accepted God and then the rest would reject him. And so we had this scripture then. We talked a little bit last week about what it means. Jesus is the stumbling block, the rock in the middle of the road. I thought Jesus came for our benefit to save us. Well, he's saying Jesus is a stumbling block to those who don't accept him. Because he's there and you can't get past him one way or the other. You either accept him and you go on past and you'll be 
uh, with God and him for eternity in heaven, or you reject him and he causes you to stumble, stumble in the wrong way. And we read a whole bunch of verses out of the previous chapters and some in future chapters of Romans, so we won't read all those again. We kind of compared all this to stumbling around, though. You hit the rock, you refuse Jesus, your spiritual life, you're stumbling around. Like and we talked about getting up in the middle of the night if you have to get up and get a drink of water or something and you don't turn the light on, no telling what you're going to step on. <laughs> I had a picture of a guy, and I, I don't think I mentioned it last week, and I couldn't find it to have Nathaniel put it up, but there was a picture of a guy with all these porcupine quills in his foot. He'd gotten up, I guess, and I don't know why, but he said he was going to kick the cat and get it out of the way. I don't know what he was doing, but it was a, a porcupine instead. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's kind of a good illustration, but I just couldn't find it. I think it was on Facebook, and I couldn't find it again. And, you know, if you see something, like on those social media sites, especially Facebook, and then you go on past a little bit, scroll on, and then you think, I wanted to go back and get that. You can never find it again. I don't know. I mean, there's 10,000 people out there putting entries in between the time you looked at it two minutes ago and today. And uh, you, sometimes you, you go back, you go back, you just can't find it. But anyhow, I thought that was a good comparison. The guy kicked the wrong thing. Now, it didn't explain what was the porcupine doing in the house. Or did he have to go outside and kick the cat out of the way to get the door open? I don't know what was going on, but anyhow, it wasn't a very good-looking picture with quills sticking all out of his foot, his bare foot like that. Well, we read all those verses last week that gave us the summation of the fact that God's law is for everyone. Salvation is for everyone because salvation removes us from the penalty of the law. The law wasn't given to us as a way to work our way into heaven. A lot of people think that's true. A lot of people will say, well, hey, we're a pretty good person. <clears throat> you know, we, we, it, we, we'll get there. You know, Jesus was a good guy, a good teacher, blah, blah, blah. You hear all that stuff. But that's not true. Jesus said, and I say this verse, it seems like about every week, but it's so true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's pretty plain and simple and hard to get around. There's that rock in the middle of the pathway. We can't move on. We can't move to heaven, and we can't move on without being judged to where we're going to spend eternity in hell or in heaven without encountering the rock in the middle of the road, and that rock is Jesus. So that's what that whole set of verses was about. <clears throat> we read in 32, let me read that out of the New Living, and they wondered about being made right. Why were some of them that rejected God? And Paul said, why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in him. And in doing that, they stumbled over that great rock. We talked a little bit about Martin Luther, who had the same problem. And he spent years trying to be a monk in a monastery, and he just found no peace. He couldn't find what he was looking for. And one day... He got started reading the Bible, and he realized that he was trying to earn salvation by his works, by what he was doing, by being a monk and being good and not doing anything. But Jesus tells us that he came to deepen the law, not to do away with it. And by deepening the law, if you go out and commit murder, obviously you've done something wrong. But if you'd like to commit murder, you've done it, it's just as wrong. That's what Jesus said. Now, I don't like necessarily that, because there's people that I w would like to do something to. <laughs> so I'm going to have to rely on God's forgiveness, too, and his salvation. Because Jesus said, I came to deepen the law. If you even harbor that evil, then you're in trouble. And remember... When Jimmy Carter was running for president, the trouble that he caused, some of you guys will remember that, the trouble he got into that he didn't cause, he, he quoted one of those verses that said, 
<clears throat> where G in that same frame of reference when Jesus was talking to the disciples and the people and he said if you commit adultery you've committed sin but I came to deepen the law and he said I say if you even look at another person whether you're a man looking at a woman or vice versa or even worse <laughs> but if you even look at another person you've committed adultery in your heart so there's that idea that we're not perfect and we're all going to deserve uh, punishment but we have God's offer of forgiveness we have his offer of salvation through believing in Jesus' sacrifice. <clears throat> well, that's kind of where we ended last time. The Jews, the chosen people of God, that didn't mean they're special people or perfect people or better people. It just meant the people that God chose to show how he works with mankind, with humanity. And I don't want to be God's chosen person in that frame of reference. I want to be chosen by God, but I don't want to be his example to the world because things are going to happen to me that I don't think I want to have happen. <laughs> I'm okay with, you know, trying to be God's person, trying to live a right life and ask forgiveness for when I did, haven't done that, you know. But <clears throat> I don't want to be the person that God uses as an example. But you know, hell is full of people that thought they were going the right direction just because of what they've done, being a good person. They followed the rules. They lived according to the law. They did everything just right according to the myriad, the numerous, numerous laws that the, the teachers, the Sadducees and Pharisees, the interpreters of the law and the Pharisees being the teachers of the law made up back in that day. They had rules on everything. How and when you were supposed to pray. And oh, it was funny, wasn't it, that they would be caught outside right at 3 o'clock at prayer time. So they'd have to, on the street corner, bow down and worship God to show everybody how pious they were. So sanctimonious, <laughs> self-righteous. Well, that was kind of their rules. They made, they made up a lot of rules to be exclusive, to exclude everybody else. Nobody else could follow those rules. And my thought was, and I think I've said it before, that everybody else probably had to go to work, <laughs> go to a job. They didn't have time to walk around and see what time it was. That they would get caught out having to show their, their self-righteousness to the world because they got caught out at prayer time or whatever. They had rules on how you were supposed to Wash your hands and let them drip dry. Let the water drop off, drip off your hands and let your hands drip dry. It would be nice if you had a fan. You could do it a little faster, I guess. But they didn't have electricity back then. So. But I think they had towels <laughs> that you could use to dry your hands. But why they came up with that kind of, I guess that towel might have been dirty. Who knows? That represented some, they didn't know about germs and stuff back then. So I don't know why they came up with rules like that. But they were rules designed to keep the average person from being able to be in their little club. Their little self-righteous club. Romans 10 tells us how to avoid hell. How to spend eternity in heaven. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That's pretty simple. Simple set of rules. Just believe. Believe Jesus is who he said he was. To believe that he's God. That makes you right. That makes you justified, Paul said there in that passage, just as if you had never sinned. God forgets our sin as far as the east is from the west, Jesus tells us. And we don't have to worry about that. We are justified. We're saved through faith, not through what we do through our works. Well, to continue on, we had talked about stumbling over the great rock in their path. And God said himself, even back in the Old Testament in Isaiah, that was a quote from Isaiah, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem or in Zion, as we read it out of the, me the message, 
that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. <clears throat> Did you know it doesn't take much to cause you to stumble? Have you ever walked out and your mind is somewhere else and there's this much of a difference between the level you're on and the next level and you didn't realize it and you stepped off and you about went down and then you looked around to make sure nobody was watching to see how clumsy you were. I've never done that, but I've heard of people that do that, of course. Did you know that a tiny rock going into a jet engine will cause that engine to just fly to pieces and be totally ineffective? Did you know that a little animal this big called a beaver can stop up a huge river with rock, rocks and logs and sticks, mainly logs and sticks, and build a beaver dam? If you've ever had a pond out somewhere, you probably know about draining those ponds. And the beavers get in there and stop up the drain because they want to have that dam and they want to have that water. Did you know that if you put a small coin on a train track, you could possibly make the train crash. We did that once, Nathaniel. I'm glad the train didn't crash. We better not do that again. We put two coins on the train. We never did find one of them. It flew off somewhere. We found the other one. <laughs> did you know that a small bullet hole can stop a person? I've always wondered, of course, I don't want to get shot and find out, but, you know, a small bullet hole causes you to collapse usually now some of the tough guys like you know Liam Neeson or some of those guys that make those movies they they go on with bullet holes in different places you know <clears throat> a microscopic virus did you know can wipe out an entire population we've experienced that where we had the COVID virus and now we have some other, what is this new thing called? Monkey pox, is that what it's called? It's supposed to be, huh? Impox. Impox, yeah, it's supposed to be sweeping the world. We're coming up on election time, so I don't know if there's any correlation there or not. <laughs> but just, that's what they're talking about, the impox virus. Well, many, many things in our world can be brought down by a small something or other. A virus like COVID or something. You couldn't even see it with your eyes. You'd have trouble finding it into the microscope unless you knew what you were looking for. Paul tells us that the Jews had the simple answer. Just trust. Trust in Jesus. But he was their stumbling stone because a lot of them chose not to believe. They didn't accept him when he was alive and they don't accept him after he rose again. They didn't believe that. They tried to make up stories about, well, somebody stole the body and blah, blah, blah. By the way, I read, this is kind of off subject, but I read a, I saw an article, I don't even know if it, what it was on, Facebook or just something that popped up on my phone. But <clears throat> they've taken AI, which I'm not a big fan of, has taken the Shroud of Turin and recreated the picture of Jesus do we have a picture around here? I thought we did somewhere. It must, it's in the back. Oh, it's over here. Okay. And it looked quite a bit like that. A little more gaunt in the face and stuff. And, of course, I'm thinking, well, AI, that depends on what somebody programmed into it. They told it how to read things. It may be right and it may not be. I don't care. I believe what the Bible says. And I don't have to have a, an exact representation of Jesus. They didn't have cameras back then, but... From the Shroud of Turin, they said they were able to recreate that image. Well, I'll believe it, I guess, when I get to heaven and see. <laughs> I'll ask him if he let AI represent him. I probably won't need to. It'll be a lot more important things to talk about at that time. John gave us the perfect test. If we look at 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. Boy, there's some good advice. Don't believe all the false prophets and uh, false people that come out saying this and that. Don't believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. 
For if there are many false, for there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. Now, read that last sentence that, Paul, that John wrote carefully. That person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming and is indeed is already here. He didn't say definitely the Antichrist is already here. If the days are short, he probably is. But he wasn't saying that he is here, because obviously we're 2,000 years later than when John wrote this. The spirit is here, though. That evil spirit that wants to invade our lives and cause us to be distracted or have doubts or maybe get occupied and become an evil person ourselves, lash out at people. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. Everything that's against what Jesus stood for, Jesus stood for truth and love and acceptance, but he also stood against sin. He does not tolerate sin. As much as he loves everybody that's been created and would like to see everybody in heaven, he realizes, Jesus has said over and over again, that isn't going to be the case. <clears throat> Broad is the path that leads to destruction and few and many who will find it, but narrow is the path that leads to righteousness, and few there are that will find that, Jesus had to say. So, that spirit of the Antichrist was alive and well then, and I would say that it's just as alive and well today, maybe more so. Maybe the Antichrist is alive. Maybe that is time we're in the last few days. When you talk about that, People want to question that. I read a deal, and I, I don't usually respond to those kind of things, but this one I just couldn't resist. And they were saying that, well, they, they were blasting, was it David Jeremiah? I think it was somebody <clears throat> for saying something like that. And I said, he, he didn't say that the Antichrist was here. He said that the spirit of evil is here. And she just blasted me for saying, now, hey, he's, he's saying he's preaching blasphemy and blah, blah, blah. And I, I just finally had to say, well, you know, we're each entitled to our beliefs. Or I'd have still been arguing with her today if I hadn't just let it go. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12.3, Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus isn't going to be master and Lord of your life, except that you have the Holy Spirit in your life and can acknowledge him. Jesus is real, and he's a blessing to those who accept him. But for those that don't, he is a hindrance, an obstacle that's in their way. And they choose to ignore him. They choose to live their own life, ignoring Jesus. He's still there. He's that stumbling block that Paul was talking about. They just try to get around it and go their own way. They go out of their way to say bad things. Boy, we have a society that does that, don't we? a society that wants to reject Christ. And if you say anything about God or whatever, you're liable to get blasted by people these days, people that are blinded to the truth. Verse 33 said, But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. For him, you will never be put to shame. It talked in the message that we read, version we read, that we will, they will not be put to shame. If you say yes to Jesus. Well, to wrap it all up, Paul was saying, unbelieving Israel has not found right standing with God, even though God represented them as his chosen people. And acknowledged that a group 
of them would be saved, but as a whole, they are not. And it, it goes up and down during history. Some periods of time that they lean more toward mostly believing in Jesus and other periods of time, the majority leans away from that. It's kind of dependent on what's going on in their history and their leadership and all of that. And Paul said, why did Israel reject salvation? Well, God has a purpose even in the rejection of Jesus, and that purpose was to reveal his mercy. He allowed Jesus to be a stumbling block to them so he could show his mercy and his grace when they asked for forgiveness. They all have to ask for forgiveness, just like we all have to ask for forgiveness that gives him a chance to show his mercy. Now, a couple of chapters ago, we dealt with Paul talking to the people that said, oh, well, if that's the case, I'll just send more. I'll do more. That shows God's grace and mercy even more. And Paul said, no, that's, you were saved from sin. You don't do it that way. That's not how to approach that. Well, Paul gave us a two-part answer here. Why Israel rejected salvation? Well, because it's man's responsibility to accept or reject. That's all we have to do. We don't have to do anything other special than that. But we have to believe and accept or turn away, rebel, and reject. Israel sought right standing with God, but they sought it the wrong way through following the rules and regulations and all of that. They rejected Jesus and his salvation, his sacrifice, his crucifixion, and his resurrection from the dead they underestimate their own sin is one reason that they reject him well I'm a pretty good person you know everything's good I've really straightened up from that few times that I did something <laughs> so I'm okay and that isn't how it works and that's what Paul says they underestimate their own sin secondly they underestimate the cost of salvation what did it cost? It cost God coming down here to live like a person, which is, had to be a humiliating task for him in the first place. But that's what he wanted to do to provide for us, to save us. And sometimes, I don't know why he wanted to save us. Why did he want me up there? I don't know. But he did. He wants you up there. He wants everybody up there. But people have that responsibility to make a choice. They underestimate the cost of grace, which was a huge cost to Jesus, a huge cost to God. Can you imagine God that created us coming to live like us and allowing himself to be put to death in the most cruel fashion that they had ever come up with to that date? Maybe to today even. Crucifixion, dying on the cross has to be a horribly cruel way to go. We've been to the McAllister. We went through the museum at the prison one time, and they have old Sparky there. You remember old Sparky, the electric chair? I think I'd rather go by electric chair than crucifixion. I'd just soon not go either way. I'd just soon go to sleep and not wake up but <laughs> someday. Not maybe tonight, but, you know, at some point. Alana wants me to hang around because I've got to make several more mortgage payments before I can go on, you know, for the insurance will cover it all. Paul said that Jesus himself was the price that God the Father paid for salvation. So salvation is the most costly thing in the entire world, the most costly thing to God. But it's given to us, offered to us freely, no price. Don't have to do anything special. Don't have to give a certain amount of money. Don't have to say certain phrases or, you know, whatever, recitations. Don't have to do handsprings down the aisle 14 times. We don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. We just have to believe in faith. We don't want to say... I'm not a sinner and I don't need to be saved by Jesus. But there's a lot of people that think that. They think of other people as sinners. You think of others as sinners? I can think of several. <laughs> but 
They probably think that about me. And it doesn't matter what I think of them or what they think of me. It's just true. We're all sinners. We stumble over that great rock that we just read about. A reference to Jesus all through the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, Jesus is the cornerstone that was rejected by the builders, we're told. But he's the only way to salvation. A lot of people will say there's a lot of different ways you can go through. A lot of different uh, religions, denominations, groups, cults, whatever it is. Different ways to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I just have to go back to that over and over again. The wrong way that so many people pick is their own works. They're a pretty good person. There's many ways as long as we're pretty good. But that's not it. Our works, our merits, our efforts, apart from Jesus, won't get us where we need to be. It won't give us God's forgiveness. You know, Paul didn't go out and test the market. He didn't hire some of these pollsters to go out and say, nine out of ten people believe that blah, 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 Jesus is the way or whatever. No, he just said the truth. <laughs> and I'll wrap it up with this. In Luke 2, verses 25 to 35, talks about the man named Simeon. You guys remember Simeon? Let me read that passage. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. <sighs> what a thing to say. Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, were taking him to the temple to, for the typical blessing, which I didn't mention on the September 12th, Thursday night, we're having either one baby or up to four babies, children dedicated here at the church, so forgot to mention that. If you want to come, that'd be fine. If not, that's okay too. <clears throat> one family is, part of the bowling family is flying in from Washington State, and they could only do it Thursday night or Friday night, so they picked Thursday night. So we're going to dedicate their one. So there'll be at least one, probably two, and maybe up to four. But that's off track. Simeon didn't talk about that coming up on the 12th. He talked about Jesus to Mary and Joseph as they brought him to the temple to be dedicated. And Simeon said what the very thing we're talking about this morning. He's destined to call many to fall and many will rise. There's that stumbling stone that Simeon talked about when he saw the baby Jesus. He recognized that the Messiah will be both the occasion of salvation and also the destruction of many in Israel. Why would anyone, you may ask then, why would anyone reject salvation? Well, as we just talked about, they refuse to acknowledge their need of salvation. They refuse to follow Jesus and let him be in charge. Salvation in that respect is offensive to them. We read different places in the New Testament to say that the word is offensive. It is offensive to people who choose to reject it. And we can see that in our society today. Many, many people find 
any mention of God or Christianity to be offensive. It goes through our schools, it goes through our government, it goes through our society. Well, salvation, Paul said, is in Jesus alone, echoing what Jesus had to say. Christ plus any other works is hell. Christ plus anything else in the place of him that's superior to him is for an eternity in hell. Faith alone, in Christ alone, that's what brings salvation. That's what Paul is reiterating over and over throughout this book. And that's the choice that each and every one of us has to make. Just like in Paul's day, he was saying they had to make that choice. Even the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, have to make that choice. We have to come to the realization that we're a sinner in need of God's grace and forgiveness and to trust only him, only Jesus, who can deliver that for us because of his sacrifice. The mercy of God, he opens our eyes to see both our sin and our Savior if we just allow that to happen. So we trust in him alone for salvation. So we started out talking that about life is like stumbling around in the darkness. Don't kick the cat when it's a porcupine. Those kind of things. Turn on the light. You won't, hopefully you won't wake your spouse up or disturb the little dog in the middle of the bed. You know, those kind of things. But we go through life in our spiritual life oftentimes stumbling around in the darkness. <clears throat> we don't want to turn on the light because we think we know where we're going. We know where everything is. Just like we talked about at the beginning last week we stumble though one time and we do it again over and over everyone has the opportunity to reach over and turn on the light that light is Jesus faith in Jesus being made right with God as Paul talked about at length in the previous chapter we all have the opportunity to put our faith in him his light will shine in our lives we can stop our stumbling with that simple confession of faith, <clears throat> faith in the one who went to the cross to rescue us from our sins. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for your guidance and instruction. <clears throat> We've asked that as we go out during the week, today, tomorrow, during the week, during the months and years, that we represent you in a manner that brings honor and glory to your name and that we do that in such a way that people can see a difference in our life and want to know what that difference is. Not that we want to go out and be so pious and self-righteous, but that we want to be real and carry the truth. Jesus said he is the truth. So we ask for his righteousness and his salvation in our lives. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing hymn number 386. You can probably sing it by memory. The family of God. <laughs>
Fred, do you want to go ahead and bless the food? Amen. All right. You guys come and join us.